you really could get wealthy out here like this. When you think about it, what is a flip? Flip is a job. So you find a property, you do all this work, you fix it up, you deal with these contractors, you sell the property. If you don't flip another property, are you still gonna get paid? No. So now in order for you to make money in the flip business, you have to constantly be finding properties. I'd rather put in all that energy and effort up front one time so that I can get paid forever. Man. Listen, you just gave the people a masterclass, bro. It has to work or it has to work. He was like, yo, real estate should be illegal. Right. Like, <laughs> you're able to go buy a property, yep. fix it up, put a tenant in it, the Burr method, the right? Burr method, right. Tell people about the Burr method. Oh man, it's, it's sweet, man, it's sweet. Like for instance, all you have to do is find an undervalued property. Yeah. Like for instance, I think uh, Mike Morgan actually you know, ran the Burr method, yeah. but he did it on a commercial space, yeah. where it's a commercial at the bottom, uh, four units up top, mm -hmm. but he found his undervalued property. Mm -hmm. Right for the low, I think he got it for. I don't know the exact numbers, but uh, he got the. So this is how the bird property, the bird method works. This is how yeah. it works exactly. You're gonna buy the property undervalued. You're gonna fix up that property. Then you're going to rent that property out. And then you're gonna re. You're gonna, you're gonna refinance that property. So you're gonna refinance the property, get all your initial capital back, and then some. Pay off the, your initial lender. You're going to repeat that process over and over and over again. That's it's, what BRRRR stands for. You're always back in the day, I'm like, what BRRRR? Like, is it cold? Like, right. buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. Yep. You just keep doing that over and over and over again. And when it comes to real estate, right, you don't have to recreate the wheel. It's just doing the same exact layup. I talk about this all the time. Do the yeah. same exact layup over and over and it's over boring, again. It's boring, though, Doug. It's, it's boring, but... It, the same exact lab is going to get you that freedom. Well, you work stop. You work your job, sometimes the same job the, for 40, the same 30 job. years. Yeah, I know some people that have been delivering mail for the last 30 years. Yeah. Right? They pick up the mail. They get in their car. They drop off you know, every single mailbox every yeah. single day, day in and day out. Yeah. But if you can do this over and over and over again and put the systems in place, you get so good at it, you can be doing five of these projects at one time, 10 of these projects at one time, and now you're able to build up that cash flow that much faster. Yeah. And um, so the best part about the Burr method is that, again, we got to analyze that deal at 65%, yeah. but you're going to put yourself in a situation where you can keep, let's say if you only have $50,000, right? Mm -hmm. And you get the $50,000 through lines of credit, business uh, credit, credit cards, what have you. But that $50,000, you can wash, rinse, and repeat that same $50,000. And every time you, you wash it and, and rinse it and repeat it, it's kicking you out another asset. That same fifty thousand dollars can just be on repeat. So you literally could just take that same fifty thousand and keep getting more properties. And with the bird method, since you're able to refinance, you're gonna you run your numbers correctly. You're gonna get that fifty thousand right back. Do it again. Get that fifty thousand dollars right back. Do it again. So now you're able to wash, rinse, and repeat. And I think that's one of the beautiful things that helped me get ahead and helped a lot of my students get ahead. Where you don't need millions and millions of dollars to grow your real estate portfolio. Yeah. If you're able to have access to fifty thousand dollars, like for instance. Uh, Ariel, Ariel's built buying apartment buildings in Connecticut, as well as a bunch of apartments in Philadelphia area, as well as single families. And where he live? He, uh, where does he live? Ariel, New York, I think you said. Yeah, yeah, he lives uh, upstate. So he's running York. the play from home. Yeah. yeah, he's running the play from home, and he was able to to quit his nine to five, so he's no longer hugging a cubicle. Yeah, he's he's working for himself. And all he's doing is just running the same play, the bird method. And you don't have to just do it on a single family. You just don't have to do it on a four unit building. You know, people are doing it on 20 unit buildings, 100 unit buildings, yeah. on movie theaters, on, on shopping malls. Literally, you could buy an undervalued shopping mall. It's the same 65% rule. Yeah. So once you get good at perfecting that 65% rule on the single family, small multis, you can go ahead and use that same, same rule, same concept to go ahead and grow your real estate empire, no matter how big you want it to be. Now on commercial, do they focus more on a cap rate or they still do the 65 just the same way like yep, you're saying? Yep. So, so one of the things when it comes to uh, commercial, they're looking at a couple of different things a little differently, right? They're looking at the NOI, the net operating income. So okay. what is the net operating income? That's all your revenue minus your expenses. But in those expenses, the mortgage and interest rate is not included. So Got we're it. talking about expenses like uh, your property management uh, expense, your taxes, your insurance. You said what's uh, not included? Your mortgage. Your mortgage your and your interest is not it. included mm -hmm. in that net operating income. Yeah. Because it's a way where we can compare apples to apples when looking at commercial buildings. Yeah. So you got your net operating income. But then you're going to divide that by your cap rate. So the cap rate is roughly uh, what buildings are selling for in that general area. And the cap rate is going to be like, hey, if you were to buy a building for $100,000 of the revenue of the net operating income coming in, 
um, that's going to be the return on your capital, essentially. Mm -hmm. So you can get that by looking at comparable sales in that particular area. That's going to give you the cap rate. Then when you divide that, the NOI, net operating income, divided by cap rate, it's going to get you the value of the building. So you, to answer your question, how can we go about getting the value of the building up when a commercial real estate property? A couple different ways, a little different than the residential. So for those that are listening, residential is when you're dealing with a single family property up to a four unit building. Once you cross over four units, now that's considered commercial. So one of the ways that where we're going to get our value increased on the commercial side is by increasing our NOI, net operating income. So one way to increase our NOI is going to be raising the rents. That's the most obvious. So we find a building and we see that the rents are very low. We can go ahead and make improvements to the property, which is going to increase those rents, which is going to increase our net operating income, which is going to, at the end of the day, increase our value. Yeah. Some other ways to go about increasing that value is going to be, okay, let's look at our expenses. Where can we go ahead and reduce these expenses? So let's say, for instance, we have a building and it has one heater for the whole entire apartment building. Yeah. So now let's go ahead and get multiple heating, heating systems where each tenant pays the heat individually. Right? We could do the same thing for the water bill. The water bill is only just one water bill coming to the unit. There's ways where you can go ahead and segregate the water bill out per unit. So now you can put, pass that water bill onto the tenant. What does that do for us? That's going to go ahead and reduce our expenses, which is going to increase our NOI, and that's going to increase the value of the building. And let's say, for instance, if we get a cheaper property management company, instead of being charged 10%, gets charges 6% of the total rent, yeah. that little increase or that savings is going to increase the NOI, which is going to increase the value of that building. Yeah. For my experienced investors, let's let's get them, let's get them um, a couple ways to like increase their revenue. I know you talked about man, one of oh, the yeah. easiest things you could do, which is powerful. I want you, to, as soon as you get in the property, just raise the rents. You told me yeah. one of your mistakes you made was yeah. you kept your rents at the same spot for five, six years yep. in a row. So I want you yep. to kind of talk about that. I think yeah. that's kind of important. Yeah, so I think I think one of the biggest things for our experienced investors, or really any investor, is making sure that you're charging the right rent, right? So you might think, oh, $1,000 is great rent, but then once you go check in to see what the market rent is going for, you might say, hey, I'm underselling myself or cutting myself short 300 bucks, 400 bucks. But one way to determine if we're charging too little or too much for rent is a couple different ways. Let me give you. There's Rentometer. I used to say rental meter, but Rentometer. Uh, dot com. So you plug in the address and you can actually get what the going rent is for a three bedroom, four bedroom, five bedroom property. Another way, which I like searching for, if you go into Google, type in FMR rent, FMR rent. So this is the actual government site. It's a HUD site that looks at every single market in the U.S. by zip code. And it'll tell you what um, a studio unit rents for a one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, four bedroom, five bedroom a unit will rent for, this is the same exact calculation that is used when we rent to Section 8, when we rent to veterans. And this is something that I use to go ahead and analyze my deals. So if I see a situation where I buy a building that might already have tenants and I see that the rents are $800 for a two bedroom, but I know that I can immediately get $1,300 a month in, for, for rent for that two bedroom, I can increase that value very quickly by just knowing that information. Mm. So Powerful. one so one of the things that I always recommend doing is looking at the FMR rents, you know, the HUD, what the market is going for, and making sure that you adjust accordingly. So every single year you should be raising those rents. I know in a tough economy and so forth, um, you know, people are like, I don't I don't want to raise the rents. I would still get in the habit of raising those rents and letting those tenants know that, hey, I'm going for a four percent increase. And you can always negotiate if they if they do drag their feet, go, okay, you know what? This year I'll cut you a deal. And instead of a 4% increase, it's going to be a 2% increase, mm. right? But you're leaving thousands of thousands of dollars on the table if you're not raising your rents. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Like all of these little small nuances matter. Like, because I know a lot of um, people buy larger commercial buildings. As soon as they go in, increase the rents. Yep. Now that purchase price ain't as as yeah. bad. I mean, exactly. When they go in and raise those rents, now they can go ahead and get the the building reevaluated with that higher NOI. So now when they refinance, they get their initial capital back. And now they basically got a free apartment building. Mm. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is crazy, dog. Yeah, it's wild. It's wild, man. You really could get wealthy out here like this. Absolutely. Share with me maybe another way that you can make money. And like a lot of times people think you and it's so crazy. Yo, we didn't talk about flips. We didn't talk yeah. about wholesaling. And right. y'all initially I didn't get into the flipping but I Doug convinced me to do do rentals. Like you right. don't really do flips. You don't really like letting go of your properties. Yep. Because essentially, like you can make the same money exactly. for the rest of your life. Hey, sorry to stop the episode. I know you're probably wondering, Neil, I always see you with that brand on. How can I be a part of it? How can I get the official gear of every entrepreneur in the world? What I need you to do is go to newageceos.com so you can get your gear. We got something for women. We got something for men. We got something for spring. We got something for fall. We got something for winter. We want to make sure you have the official gear of every entrepreneur in the world. Go to newageceos.com. Because like when we look at flips, right, the average flipper might be making 20% of, you know, um, on their money. Mm -hmm. Like, let's say, for instance, let's keep it simple. Let's say you're flipping something for $100,000. Uh, you buy it, you utilize that 65% rule. So let's say, for instance, you bought a property for, for uh, 25000 put $40,000 worth of work into it. Mm -hmm. So you have equity of about $35,000. So it's like $35,000. But by the time we go ahead and pay 6% to the realtor, mm -hmm. right, we're going to have to pay taxes. We're yeah. going to have to pay closing costs. Mm -hmm. You know, we're really only touching probably right around twenty. dollars anywhere between 18 to say $20,000. When all we could do is we could say, you know what, I'm gonna keep this property, I'm gonna collect rent on it, but I'm gonna refinance it at 75% of the value of that property. So now we're able to go ahead and put in our pocket about 15,000 give or take of, of tax-free money in our pocket. Because mm. by the time you take the flip money, you pay taxes on it, it's probably gonna equal very close to what you could get if you kept that property. Yeah. So I always encourage, if possible, to keep that property and be in a cash flowing uh, situation where you can collect that cash flow. Because at the end of the day, when you think about it, what is a flip? A flip is a job. So you find a property, you do all this work, you fix it up, you deal with these contractors, you sell the property. But if you don't flip another property, are you still gonna get paid? No. No. Yeah. So now in order for you to make money in the flip business, you have to constantly be finding properties. You can't take any any time off because what's a, what that's going to do is going to ink it's going to kill your earning potential. Yeah. So I'd rather put in all that energy and effort up front one time so that way I can get paid forever. Yeah. And that's really what the true value is is of being a buy and hold real estate investor. Yeah. Right? Is we're playing the wealth game here. The flip business is nice, you get quick cash and so forth, but you're not playing the wealth game. Yeah. You still got to go ahead and find the next deal. Yeah. You're only as good as your next deal in the flip business. Yeah. Tell me about the Section 8 blueprint, bro. Because I know you literally, you have you need to create something called the Section 8 Bible. Like, yeah. you figured it out. But it's so funny. There are a lot of undereducated people. Me being one of them back in the day was, don't rent the Section 8. They'll destroy your stuff. Yeah. You don't want to deal with those type of people. Yep. Like, they're not, like, they're, they're just like us. They're, yeah. Anybody could be on Section 8, right? So, kind of, I want you to break down, like, I think it's an amazing program, yeah. right? Um, and you kind of figured out a way to, you've generated millions of dollars yeah. from Section 8. Oh, and yeah. You always talk about not missing your rent money. It's like a bank. I know yep. uh, you're always traveling. You travel every yeah. single month. And you're like, yo, yeah. that that direct deposit <laughs> hit. So yeah, kind of talk about it because you got people like, Doug, I'm cool. Uh, some people think of Section 8 and they think about like, Somebody who's automatically going to disrespect your property. Yeah. They they got a stigma yep. around it. So I kind of yeah. wanted you to kind of break that down a little bit. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So right now, just kind of break down, you take a you know step a little higher. Right now, there's a shortage of affordable housing. There's people that literally cannot afford a roof over their head. So there's programs such as Section 8 that give these people some help, right? Everyone needs uh, some help. They need a roof over their head. So with Section 8, they're actually subsidizing housing. They're subsidizing the payments where the government will actually pay the majority of people's rent just so they can have a place over their head, right? Because the government doesn't want people and families, women and children just in the street, you know, living in tents. They want to provide people with a safe place to live and grow and work. So with Section 8, it's been around for years and years and years. But what I like about Section 8 is the fact that they never missed a payment. So during the pandemic, you know, during the recession, during you know, government shutdown, they still were paying. Mm -hmm. So now we're in a situation where, okay, we got 
you know, in the game of real estate, the biggest fear that people have is that are they going to get paid, right? Are, are the tenants going to pay them? So one way to combat that fear and to ensure that you're going to get paid is through programs like Section 8. So I, I chose to do Section 8 because it was, kind of, it was kind of funny. I knew I wanted to get into real estate, and I was looking in a market called Coatesville. And my cousin Marsha at the time, she had a property right there in Coatesville. It was a huge four-bedroom, uh, two-bath property right you know, right next to the park. I said, and she was like, hey, cuz, guess what? Guess how much I pay for this property? She said, like, $200. I said, like, how are you renting this whole property out for $200? Like, what type of scam are you running? So, oh, no, no, there's no scam. It's Section 8. The government will actually pay the remaining of the rent, and I just have to come up with $200. And guess what, cuz? If I lose my job, they'll go ahead and pay the $200 for me. Mm. I said, man, that's, that's sweet for the landlord. Yeah. Right? So when I bought my first property in Coatesville, I said, I'm going to do Section 8. So I went through the Section 8 class. It was just a, a you know, one-day training for this one. One-day training, very easy. And they just want to make sure that the property is safe, it's livable, there's no hazards going on, and that you have your rental license, you're up to date on your taxes. So now when I got that first property, my monthly note was only 550 bucks. Mm-hmm. I rented the property out for 1250 now, you know, this was years and years and years ago. Now that properties were being rented out for $1,650, just to show you how rent increases. Yeah. But guess what stayed the same? That $550 is now about $600 because taxes went up. Mm-hmm. But that margin, that spread is huge. And that's just on one property that I have locked in with Section 8 paying me every single month. So that property I picked up for the low, I think I probably only owe at this point maybe $25,000, $30,000 at this point because the tenant, also the government, right, was paying down that note every single month. So now what did that do for me? It increased the equity. And during that time, since I bought the properties about 50 cents on a dollar, the values have went up. So now that same property I picked up for 50,000 bucks is now worth 130,000, hmm. but I only owe $30,000 on the property. Wow. So that's $100,000 on that one property plus the cash flow that we were receiving every single month. So with the section eight, like they, at the end of the day, people in Section 8, they don't want to destroy your property. Mm-hmm. And the reason why they don't want to destroy that property is because they don't want to get kicked off the program. Yeah. How many people want to get kicked off a program that's paying the majority of their rent? That's foolish. Yeah. Right? So I decided, you know, I'm going to rent the Section 8. Plus, you're doing a good thing, right? When I say doing a good thing, you're providing a safe place to live. And the way I fix up my Section 8 properties, they have quartz countertops, stainless steel appliances, white shaker you cabinets. make them right. I make them right. So they don't want to leave. Yeah. Because I want that long-term tenant. Yeah. Are you playing this game for the long haul? I, you know, I'm not into the short-term rentals and so forth. I need that tenant that's going to be here for the next 30 years. Yeah. So one way I do that is make the house indestructible. Mm-hmm. So when I say indestructible, like there's the Philly Row homes, I'm exposing the brick. But one of the things that I'm also doing- can't mess up the sheet rock. can't mess up the sheet rock. You're right, no kids are punching holes through the brick, right? If they are, they, you know, they got some problems. But one, of, but one of the things is that- you know, I'm doing certain things, little subtle things, right? Because I know what will fail inspection and things that often break. So like, let's say, for instance, we're in the bathroom. Most people put the cute little uh, toilet paper holders. They drill them right to the side of the cabinet. Nine times out of 10, somebody's going to rip that right off the cabinet, mm-hmm. right off the side of the cabinet. Mm-hmm. Guess what will happen? Section 8 inspection, you'll fail for that. Mm-hmm. So what am I going to do? Because it happened enough times, and then yeah. you got to pay a maintenance person 50 bucks to go ahead yeah. and screw that back on. Mm-hmm. Why not eliminate it? Yeah. One of the other things I eliminate is towel racks. People put the cute towel racks so that way the tenants go ahead and slap the towel up. I eliminate that too. Yeah. Every single property that had towel rack, they all broke and they always failed inspection. So mm. I just eliminate it. Mm. They're going to be all right without a towel rack. They're going to figure it out. Yep. Right? Some people I know, I know I put up a post, people are like, but I would never move into the property without a towel rack, without a toilet paper holder. Yeah. It's like people just go on Amazon. These things cost eight bucks, nine bucks. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So it's just that, that, that belief system. But now when you figure out how to eliminate certain things that are know are going to be a problem further on down the road, take care of them early on so that we don't fail inspections on, on the uh, back end. But once you have that guaranteed income, you just wash, rinse, and repeat. So every property I find, I go ahead and make sure that, okay, do the numbers work based off of Section 8? Numbers work based off of Section 8. I run my cash flow numbers. I run my 65% rule, make sure it's a good deal. This is what I teach all my students and so forth. Yeah. We dive into detail on this to make yeah. sure that they're always in a winning position. Mm, powerful. Right? Because right? it's so important that we set ourselves up to win. So now we make sure that they're in the winning position, get the guaranteed rents coming in. So now it's a foolproof system that can be duplicated. So imagine as you continue to accumulate properties after properties, and you could do this work in a nine to five, right? I built the majority of my empire 
a real estate portfolio working a nine to five. Oh, my, okay. my students, you know, they build up their empire by working a nine to five. And a lot of them actually get out of the nine to five because they say, hey, yeah. I surpassed my nine to five income with my rental income coming from these properties. Mm. So it's just a situation where it's, it's a foolproof. It works in every single market. Yeah. And you're in a situation where it's just a numbers game. That's good, bro. Yeah. Yo, you are literally un you're unlocking wealth for people right now. Yeah. Like you're un like literally you're unlocking wealth and then you're teaching you how to keep it in your family forever. It's just right. I wish I would have did this sooner. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah that's, that's, all that's what I'm saying. about like yeah. why didn't I do it sooner? Yeah, exactly. And on bigger stuff. Yeah, yep. And it's it's um it's something where you know, of course is is better or, no, what is it? I think Drake says it better late than never. Yeah. Right. So we have we have students. I have mentees that are in their fifties and their sixties and so forth. There's even a student, you know, Marilyn. She's doing new construction, uh, rent to rent to own, or excuse me, build to rent properties. Yeah. But she's learning the game. She already has kids and so forth. But she's literally, I see her. She's taking her kids to those properties. They're you know they're digging with the with the shovel in the ground. <laughs> yeah. Right. She's showing them. She's planting the seed. It started with you, mind. bro. But it started with opening up that mind and her tapping into the mentorship. Now she's on a whole nother level. She's got storage uh, units with just materials where she's good for the next 10, 20 projects. Yeah. Like she's growing tremendously. It just, it just brings it back to it all starts with one person, bro. And yeah. You help hundreds of people get in there. Probably thousands, excuse yeah, me. Yeah, thousands. Of this. Get into the game, bro. It's just the power. Of Ed Milet talk about the power of one. Yeah. Most people are one opportunity, one play, one resource from changing their entire life. But 100%, I believe everybody needs to add the, the real estate toolkit. Oh, yeah. Like, you got it. Like, I don't you care about the met. All of the stocks is good. <laughs> NFT. Yeah. My NFTs is down right now. <laughs> oh, man. I'm, I'm, I already, I'm I already know. Yeah, you're I spent 240000 on, 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 on an eight picture. <laughs> We my fault. Sort that, of subject. Sort of subject. That, that joint worth probably like thirty thousand oh, right now, and it may come back. Right. But what if I would have bought a building for two hundred and forty? I don't think anything can happen in the world where the building will lose. Yo, listen, eighty percent of its that, value. That, build, bro. that building's not going down to zero. I was talking to one of my one of my friends, also in real estate. Yeah. Right. They had a fire. The building burnt down to the ground. This is a building they bought for a hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars. Guess how much. Guess what size check they gave him to rebuild this building? Three fifty. Four hundred thousand dollars. Wow. He's like, listen, I'm not even gonna rebuild the building. I'll take the four hundred thousand, flip it, and buy some more bricks. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in this episode. I hope you're getting an extreme amount of value. I want you to go ahead and comment below. Share with me your biggest takeaway. In addition to that, my number one goal is for me to be able to grow all of my social platforms so I can give you info, insight, strategy, and gain from every platform there is. So take a minute to follow me on Instagram at Neil So same exact name on Twitter, same exact name on TikTok, and follow me on LinkedIn at Nehemiah Davis. I would love for you to be able to be tuned into my articles and everything that I drop relating to helping you get to that next level in your life. Tune so in. so there's ways where like when I was getting started in real estate, people always came with these excuses, these reasons. They're like, well, what if the building burns down? Yeah. All right, well, that's why I have insurance. Mm-hmm. What if the tenants don't pay? All right, that's why I have guaranteed rents coming in from Section 8. What if the sewer line breaks and you got to pay $8,000? Okay, that's why I have the sewer line insurance, which will cover it for $12. Right. There's there's these people that are going to come up with all these reasons, all these excuses to why you shouldn't or why you can't. Right. You have to go beyond that. But a lot of times people stop right there when people asking these crazy what if questions Mm -hmm. because they don't have the knowledge. Mm -hmm. Once you have the knowledge, now you have the skill set and the tool set to overcome any challenge. Yeah. But one way to get the knowledge is by plugging into somebody that already has the experience. Yeah. Once you plug in with somebody that has experience in something you don't know, you could bring it to them. You say, oh, this is all you have to do. And just with, by having that knowledge, you're able to execute, you're able to add value, you're able to be in a situation where you're building your empire and getting those cash flowing assets. Mm. Ooh, you talking that talk, dog. Hey, mm, mm, mm. hey I, I'm just excited. I'm just sitting here thinking about the more wealth I'm about to create. Oh, yeah. More importantly, people. So, listen, we might got to turn this into two episodes. We went way over. It's supposed to be a 40 minute episode. Yeah, we we just been yeah. going in, but um, I guess. Let's one, and we'll wrap after this, just, oh man, you help people become contractors. You help them start oh, yeah. lead business. Like, oh, yeah. you help people go get 50 to 100,000 in credit. 
Yeah. Maybe get a balance transfer play. You got you yeah. got plays literally. Oh, man. We'll, this, this, this plays for days. Yeah, man. we'll be this here for hours for, just to think about yeah. all the so, plays that you got. So so one of the plays with the balance. And this credit too. So this yeah. uh, we ain't touch on credit. Oh so yeah, we ain't touch on credit, business credit. Oh, like gosh. one of one of the guys, Jay, he just I I went to his project. He said, Hey Doug, I'm about to uh, tap into one point one million dollars of business uh, credit. Crazy, right? And you know so he he, he quit his job. You told. Me. Oh yeah, he quit his job. He was in finance, so yeah. he could relate. He came to the ride along. Yeah. I remember him taking crazy notes. Yeah. He's like, I'm in finance. Like Doug, I'm tired of hugging this cubicle. Yeah. Like I need a way out. Yeah. He literally followed the blueprint to the T. Yeah. So transfer. to go back to your question, the balance transfer play, right? This is one of the plays where when I was tapped, I'm talking. About I had all my cash with that project that I, you know, was going out of pocket dealing with the contract on that first huge, you know, full out renovation. I was tapped for cash, but I knew that I wanted to continue to buy properties, right? So uh, I get in the mail, a balance transfer check. So oftentimes we just shred these up. I say, you know what? I remember years ago when my buddies mentioned that he did something with a balance transfer check. So I just started looking into it. So with this balance transfer check, they had 0% interest for 16 months. Yep. And then they, there was a, a upfront cost of 5% of whatever balance you transfer. But to kind of take a step back, what are balance transfers used for? I used to work in the credit card um, industry, right, in finance. So let's say, for instance, I work for Bank of America. And let's say you just apply for a Bank of America credit card. Mm -hmm. So we say, congratulations, Neo. We, we have this uh, Bank of America credit card. Your yep. limit is $25,000. Mm -hmm. But let's say you already have a, a membership with Chase. You have a Chase credit card, for, say, for $25,000. Cool. But let's say what Bank of America, one of the easiest ways for Bank of America to steal balances over from whatever company, say from Chase, and bring them over to the Bank of America books is by simply doing something called a balance transfer. Mm -hmm. So what they want to entice you to do is write a check, put it in your bank account, deposit it. Now you have those funds and they want you to take those funds to pay off your Chase balance. Mm -hmm. Right. So that way, what, what just happened? Now that $20,000 that you owe Chase, now you're going to owe Bank of America, mm -hmm. but they're giving you a teaser of 18, it could be anywhere between 12 to 18 months, no interest. Mm -hmm. So most people are like, oh, well, no interest, I got to pay. Great. But what if you didn't have a balance with Chase, but you still have the balance transfer check? So you do the same process. You would deposit it into your personal or your business yeah. account. Now you're going to owe Bank of America, but you're paying 0% interest for that 12 to 18 months. Mm -hmm. But you can take that money and now you can use it for your down payment or your construction of a property, mm. right? But if you are using it as a down payment, let's say, for instance, um, you're doing a, a conventional or a conventional mortgage or FHA mortgage, they're going to want you to show two years of, excuse me, two months of bank statements. So you just want that money to season in your account for at least two months before you uh, want to use it, utilize it as, um, as your down payment money. Yeah. But what I did was, since I was using investing uh, loans, I was able to use that balance transfer to go ahead and purchase the property actually outright, because I, I combined two balance transfer checks, deposit them into my bank account, so I was able to buy a property right in Coatesville for $25,000, all using the balance transfer. So I owned it free and clear. Wow. I used the rest of the balance to fix the property up. It didn't need much work, because it was a foreclosure. Yep. Didn't need much, much work. And then I took it to that local bank, refinanced the property, Got all the capital back that from, that needed to pay off the balance transfer, pay off the credit card, but then I had some additional cash left over, about fifteen thousand dollars. I used that extra fifteen thousand dollars to create a whole new um, pest control business. Wow! Off of one balance transfer. Off of one balance transfer check. Yep. So it's like there's so many different ways to tap into money. So most people want to get into real estate, but they feel like they don't have funding, they don't have access to capital. Believe it or not, you have more access to capital than you think. There's balance transfers, there's credit cards, there's private money, there's hard money, there's personal loans. There's all type of these loans available for you. All you need to do is be able to find the deal and be able to implement the steps necessary to do so. Man, you, man listen, you just gave the people a master class, bro. Yeah, I think uh, so for a word of wisdom, I think in order to achieve, you must believe. Yeah. Right. So we have to constantly be working on our belief system mm -hmm. and any and everything that we want, we can actually get. We can obtain it. But we have to to achieve. We must believe you have to first believe. Yeah. And the journey of a thousand miles starts with just one step. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes people never take the step. But for those that do take the step, that next step after that first step is that much easier. And now you're on the road to building your own empire. So some ways to go ahead and get tap in. You can follow me on Instagram, yeah. Doug Dept D E P T E. 
But I also have a mentorship program that you can tap into where I'm literally giving you the fundamentals necessary to build your very own. This is not fundamentals, bro. No, no, this is is high level. This is high level. This is actually where you're going to be able to build your very own real estate empire. But the best part is you can duplicate it property after property after property. Like, for instance, there's a a lot of my mentees. They actually share the information with their family and friends because they see how fast they're moving and how how they're accelerating and growing where it's just – it feels good when, I, when mentees, when I talk to them, yeah. hop on the Zoom calls, even go just look at their projects and see the growth that they, that they are achieving yeah, simply, by, simply because they had that blueprint. They had the step-by-step guide. Yeah. They had that guidance. They have, you know, we got the, the credit coach. We got yeah. the uh, business lending coach. We have wow. so many different people coming in, accountability calls, right? We have a community where they can tap into other people that are just like them in that same space, the same mindset. Because when I was getting started in real estate, it wasn't that many people with the mindset. I would talk to my coworkers. They just want to hug that cubicle to their, you know, for the rest of their life to six yeah. or seven and a half. Mm-hmm. Right? So there wasn't that community where I can go ahead and bounce ideas off of, get that encouragement, you know, ask a question, and get an answer immediately. Right? So by building that community, it feels good because I can see the success of my students that they're really taking things to the next level. Powerful, bro. Well, listen, thank you so much for coming on. Listen to me, y'all. That, my friends, was literally a master class. I'm going to make sure I drop all of Doug's links in the show notes below so you guys can go tap in. I'm letting y'all know this, man. He helped impact my life in so many ways. Like, I literally got into real estate because of him. So I'm letting y'all know this. Go sign up for the mentorship. Go get a book. Whatever he got, go get it so you can ultimately grow yourself and grow your business. Because I don't know if anybody knows, but real estate, is the key to financial wealth. And it will never go out of style. I've been in a lot of different businesses um, earlier on in my career, and all of them I don't no longer do. Real estate, I'll be doing it for the rest of my life. I'm challenging you to do the exact same. We'll see you in the next episode.